Cadillac, once a revered name. Once. What happened? How did the standard of the world fall so hard? What is it with this company that keeps on struggling? The struggle to stay relevant. The struggle to beat the competition. The struggle that is Cadillac. Welcome everyone to episode 29 of the Automotive History series where we're going to take a closer look at what once was the king of luxury and how Cadillac fell from grace and currently struggles to remain relevant. The word Cadillac brings to mind images of outrageous design with soaring fins, rock and roll music and Elvis, of country club parties and film premieres. But where does this image come from? Well, Cadillac established itself as a maker of luxury vehicles in the 1930s and 1940s, part of parent company's General Motors corporate strategy and price ladder. But in the 1950s, Cadillac truly was at the top of the game. Brand new overhead valve V8 engines, high-tech features like the Atronic Eye, and industry-leading design gimmicks like Dagma bumpers and tail fins. Cadillac had made a name for itself. It became the benchmark of the American luxury car and how its customers rode comfortably in Cadillacs, so did Cadillac ride comfortably on its growing recognition and ever-increasing sales figures. Besides its standard set of luxury, comfort, quality, options and cutting-edge looks, Cadillac comes with something a little extra that the others don't have. Chachet, or as the French like to call it, cachet. It's Cadillac that proclaimed to be the standard of the world. It's Cadillac that had the soaring fins. It's Cadillac that always won the sales battle among the American luxury car makers. It's Cadillac that is sung about in rock and roll songs. At one point, rivaling Lincoln, Imperial and Packard might have made a car that in every aspect is the better option than Cadillac. But it lacks that brand recognition. It lacks that little extra. I like to think that, much like some people, Cadillac is famous for just being famous. And you couldn't say that of Lincoln. Sure, the US president drove one at one point, but it's not the same compared to all of the American jet set that drove Cadillacs. There was no question about it. When you own a Cadillac, you made it in life. You have ascended past your neighbors. The grass is greener on your side of the white picket fence. You are the king of suburban drive. No need to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses have to keep up with you. There is no... Well, you probably know what I mean by this point. Cadillac reached its all-time zenith at the start of the 1970s. The cars increased in every possible dimension. Length, width, engine size and fuel consumption and total production output. Cadillac became invincible. Take a look. Sales record after sales record were broken during the early 70s, with an exception of 1971 because of a union strike. One would think that the oil crisis of 1973 would put a definitive end to it all. How could a thirsty 8.2 liter Eldorado survive? Well, miraculously it did. And here we are, three years after the oil crisis, and the total sales has once again surpassed the pre-oil crisis sales figures. So if even an oil crisis couldn't get Cadillac on its knees, what could? <laughs> Laziness. Cadillac became lazy. And this is a major pitfall for anyone who's at the top of the game and under the impression that nothing can get in his way anymore. Not the competition, not an oil crisis. It doesn't matter what you do anymore, it'll always be a success. Everything you touch turns into gold. But what if it isn't? Times were changing. And for more information about this, I'd like to refer to you to my Malays era series. An oil crisis is one thing to deal with, but on top of that came all sorts of government regulations regarding safety and emissions. Okay, that's doable. But wait, what is that building across the street? Huh? A, Mer a Mercedes dealership? BMW? European luxury imports? What the hell? Where did that came from? 
The real threat to Cadillac and other American luxury car makers was the threat from overseas. By the mid-70s, because of the gas crisis, wealthier folks looked for more fuel-efficient alternatives, but still wanted to drive something luxurious. People realized that Mercedes and others offered pretty much everything they sought in a luxury car, and on top of that, their cars offered relatively good fuel economy and an interesting or, or sporty ride. An exact opposite of the float boats that were Cadillacs. And in the meantime, Cadillac was more accessible than ever. With a bit of luck, even mid-level managers could afford a Cadillac at the start of the 70s. You were once the proud owner of the only Cadillac in the country club's parking lot. But now even your golfing buddies also turned up in Coupe de Ville's. You start to lose your sense of superiority, and before you know it, you're in a Mercedes. Double the price of a Cadillac, ready for a test drive. Cadillac reacted in the later 70s with a moderately successful Seville. It was an internationally sized Cadillac with a heavier price tag compared to Caddy's full-size models. A good effort, but also the only good effort as after the release of the Seville, Cadillac started its great decline. The replacement of the Seville was this thing, a neoclassical and Baroque-styled vehicle, truly fashionable at the time, but horribly outdated in the next couple years. And Cadillac made a huge mistake with the Cimarron, a chromed-up Chevrolet, and a supposed-to-be import fighter. Once again, I'm keeping this short, as I mentioned both these cars before in my Malaise Era series. But from here is where our journey begins. By the mid-80s, Cadillac suffered from the increasing popularity of European luxury imports. Cadillac only sold what they used to sell for over decades now. Large, comfy sedans and coupes. Sportiness wasn't on the menu. Even the semi-sporty Eldorado turned into a comfy coupe with some sharp edges. Cadillac needed a new flagship. A car that would show Cadillac would head into a new era. A new top model that was also going to bridge the gap between European sportiness and traditional American luxury. This surely would get both the youngsters out of the BMWs and the grandpas out of the Fleetwood Broms. A new top model. The Cadillac Alante for 1987. A Euro-inspired open-top roadster. GM had this idea to punch the exclusivity out of it and came up with an intricate plan. The car bodies and interiors were designed and constructed over a pit in Farina in Italy. The bodies would then be flown through an air bridge back into the US and coupled to Cadillac's chassis and drivetrain. Specially equipped Boeing 747s transported the bodies from Turin to Detroit. Through this way, GM thought they could sprinkle some 1959 Eldorado coach built by Pin and Farina magic over this. And you can bet that the marketing department would come up with such slogans like designed by Italians, built in America. Imagine buying a car that has been shipped, no, flown in from Italy, the land of the designers and the coach builders. Wow, that'll do. Well, it didn't. And this is the problem with Cadillac and GM. As much as you try to sugarcoat it by making it look, smell and sound European, it is still an American car underneath. The Olante failed in many ways. What was supposed to be a jack of two trains became a master of none. The youth still favored their Mercedes and BMWs, as the Alante was not even all that powerful or sharp to drive, and the grandpas didn't like such a brute and unrefined hot rod. It gave them instant arthritis just by looking at it. Not to mention the insane production cost, resulting in a sticker price of around 60,000 bucks for a car where you had to manually remove the top. Okay. It should be noted that although the Alante failed to beat the competition, Cadillac did succeed in making a true Cadillac. The car that made no compromise in its development and Cadillac went to great lengths to create it, just as they've done in the past. By the late 80s and early 90s, Cadillac resorted to the types of cars that worked for them, the land yachts. The sporty aspirations were once again gone, and Cadillac pleased this ever-aging demographic like never before. Cadillac rode into the 90s with such retirement communities on wheels like the Fleetwood and the DeVille. But once again, problems started to appear. Cadillac, for now, didn't really compete with Euro luxury brands with all their sportiness and such. So. 
Whew. But there was a new threat coming up. The competition from the Far East. Many Japanese brands were forbidden to export their domestic luxury cars to the USA because of a voluntary export restraint. And so, as a workaround, Japanese companies launched their own USA luxury car brands. Honda was the first with luxury brand Acura, and Toyota and Nissan quickly followed with Lexus and Affinity, respectively. This phased Cadillac with a new set of challenges. Other than the new revolutionary North Star engine, Cadillac gave up on performance, but now had to fight to remain relevant in the comfort, luxury and reliability classes. Cadillac kept on making large sedans and even an SUV, the Escalade, but it was a dead-end road. Quite literally, as by the late 90s, Cadillac customer base consisted of two types of buyers. Dead, or about to be dead. You are neither dead nor dying. What is your purpose here? And you know what? It is time for another attempt at something European and sporty, and making Cadillac appeal again for people under 72. Cadillac introduced the Catera in 1997, a mid-sized sedan with German roots, as the Catera was based, oh no, sorry, a blatant rebadge of the German Opel Omega. Opel was also owned by GM. And from my European perspective, Opel isn't quite the Cadillac, or Mercedes for that matter. Not even a Buick, more like the German Chevy. Hmm, Chevrolet. GM, will you ever learn? Cadillac made the exact same mistake with the Catera as they did with the Samaran some two decades prior. GM, will you ever learn? The major pitfall with this car is that it was European, looked European, drove European, but luxury-wise wasn't quite the Cadillac or BMW, strengthening the idea that Cadillac interiors were mostly made out of cheap plastic and fake wood. Some even went as far to say as it looked a lot like a cheap Chevy Malibu. By the start of the 2000s, it was time to truly change Cadillac. A restart. A blank slate. Starting all over, as Cadillac really messed up in the late 90s. Now it was truly time to out-German the Germans. Where have I heard that before? Caddy launched a new design philosophy for the 21st century called Art and Science, which in my ears more sound like a school subject, but what do I know? Art and science would revolutionize Cadillac, and sure enough, Caddy dared to step away from their vintage-looking, stretched three-box sedan style and adopt Euro styling, meaning a shorter and higher trunk, a more composed stance, along with more aggressive lines and less chrome and ornate details. Gone with things like the egg crate grille and the exclusive names like Eldorado and Fleetwood, now replaced with nondescript nomenclature like STS and DTS just like the Germans would do. The first model to come to fruition because of the art and science movement was the Cadillac CTS in 2003. And on a personal note, I consider the CTS still to be very good looking, and its design holds up really well. In fact, I had my very first test drive in a CTS when I was looking for a first car, but found the ride, and especially the interior, underwhelming. And that was about the only criticism the CTS received. The interior wasn't all that Cadillac-like, but the rest of the car was praised. The design, the road handling, the engines. Sure, Cadillac still had a long way to go, but this, well, this was a great start. And would this great start lead to a better future? Well, that's what we're going to find out in part two. Stay tuned and remember to like, share and subscribe if you want more of this.